It was grand final day in Melbourne and 107,935 wildly cheering fans were at the MCG to make it a real beauty. Hawthorne, the Hawks to their supporters, were up to their first premiership. The huge crowd, a record since reserved seating systems were introduced, saw the Hawks begin nervously. In fact, in the first quarter, they made many mistakes and were 10 points behind. Then, urged on by feverish supporters, the Hawks began to wear the Bulldogs down. Footscray had won its way to the grand final with its speed, but the young team found Hawthorne too strong. The Hawks were soaring to victory, and the final goal made it Hawthorne 94 and Footscray 51. A decisive victory to give Hawthorne the first premiership in its history. Hawthorne Football Club has a proud tradition being the most successful AFL-VFL club over the past 50 years, as celebrated here in the Hawks Museum. I was lucky enough to experience success with the Hawks through the 70s and 80s, in an era often recognised as one of the most dominant in the history of our Indigenous game. But all that success was built on a foundation stone set in place by those men who toiled away in the brown and gold for decades upon decades until we finally broke through for our first Premiership in 1961, on which all our future success has been built. Our 1961 team were our first Premiership side, and to those men, we all owe a debt of gratitude. This is their story. You'll never forget, especially the first one, and that is something that they can never take against away from that side, those players, that we were the first ones to put Hawthorne on the map. After playing in, in the VFL for 37 years, and I think they'd only made the finals once before, uh, it was an enormous uh, thrill, you know, for everyone. And, and the look on their faces, I mean, that, that's, that's the thing that's going to stay with me, you know, until the day I die, a, a look of, you know, absolute pleasure, you know, that their team had, had, had won a premiership at last. 1960 saw the appointment of two crucial leaders in the club's path to premiership success. John Kennedy as coach and Graham Arthur as captain. They didn't know it at the time, but the right personnel were in place on and off the field to achieve the club's ultimate goal. That Hawthorne 1961 group, um, you could spread it from the 20 players to maybe 50 people. And those 50 were a common bond with the, with the 20, those 30, the Doc Ferguson's and Ron Cooks and Jack McLeod's and all these people. They had exactly the same approach to team and loyalty to the jumper. He believed that if the club was to prosper, it certainly needed to, uh, to, to have clear, firm goals, good leadership, good people, um, and of course good footballers. One of the things that was a burning desire, we're coming off a year, years when the club hadn't won many games, was to stop um, buying second-hand players. An agenda that driven by Sandy and, uh, and those around the board table to, to not get cast-offs and to grow Hawthorne players so that they can have the culture that they wanted to develop. Those decisions that brought the 61 Premiership around were made eight years before. I would say John Kennedy would have been equally um, uh, behind. Confres. Confres started in 1961. They were led by a group of businessmen, led by Sir Henry Winnicky. He had a lot of mates down there and they, they continued on as the Confres and he continued on as their president for quite some time after I departed the scene. The then secretary of the club, Ron Cook, asked Sir Henry Winnicky to form this businessmen's group to basically support the players, uh, find jobs and raise funds for the club. Jack Har was very tough, very hard player and then we've got to give him a lot of credit because a lot of the players that played in that 61 Premiership side were coached by him and then John took over in 1960 and we just missed out on the finals in 1960 on percentage. Kennedy was a man that understood players. He understood people. He was a people person. Even though I thought at the time when he took over uh, that being a, a playing mate to take over the mantle as a coach 
with his mates, he was the perfect person that could do that transition. And his style of game was just different altogether and we profited from it. When John took over his coach, well, fitness went from just ordinary uh, Tuesday, Thursday to uh, another, another level. On your marks, go. Touch the fence up at the railway line, uh, up the terrace uh, stand there, and back again, and down. Down again, on your marks, face the railway line and off again. So we used to train uh, very hard uh, on training nights, and sometimes he'd throw in an extra training night during the week. And we'd play on Saturday, of course, but then we'd go and train on Sunday. You weren't allowed off the track until you were on your hands and knees, effectively. The Kang was good, he was in it all the time himself. So he never asked us to do something that he couldn't do himself. John would say to us, if, I could, if he could run a mile in five minutes, he expected us to run a mile in five minutes. He didn't push handball in the early stages. And then one game, we had a disaster. And the Kennedy mine said, how do I fix this? And the next training night, we were not allowed to kick the ball for the entire night. We had to handball, which is unheard of. And Barassi did it later, but John Kennedy did it first. And the next game, we did a lot of handball. And the game, we moved much more fluidly. We didn't want stop-start, we wanted constant movement. It was the way we wanted the game. Now, the game plan would be repeatedly that. The speed and fitness had to tell. Kennedy's conditioning was honed at the club's home ground, Glenfrey Oval. The sardine can was a narrow ground that encouraged the Hawks' tight style of football. I have a love affair with Glenfrey Oval. Um, I used to love it when it was muddy. Uh, and uh, I knew the opposition wouldn't like it. The other sides just didn't like to play their pretty football on it, but it suited us. We were tough and into the ball and, and, and the mud and the slush and etc. I laugh when I hear the critics today complaining about the grounds being too muddy. I mean, the Glenferry Oval used to be about three inches thick of mud sometimes when we played on it. Edward of Hawthorne. He drives back towards full forward. Young rises, can't mark it. Here's a chance for Simmons. Simmons can't pick it up either and gets an ease over in the middle, middle of the back and it stacks on the mill. I think umpire Nash is going to bounce it. Certainly Glen Ferry was a wonderful experience. Uh, uh, very, very um, parochial and uh, very uh, close-knit community. The old, the, the grandstand, the current grandstand now, I mean, it used to be Hawthorne supporters. They used to have the uh, the bugle there uh, to to rev us up, whether we were losing or winning. And you'd, you'd hear this bugle, you know, come out, blurt her out, and then you'd hear the Hawthorne chant. So it certainly had some advantage, I think, over the opposition. My cousin used to live next door to Alf Milne, and uh, he was the first one to bring his cornet along and my cousin bought his bugle and then I bought mine so we sort of just it was just an ad hoc sort of a thing. If we were behind you know, on the scoreboard we tried to G them up a little bit but uh, yeah we used to make a lot of noise every time they kicked the goal. But there wasn't too much celebration at the start of the 1960 season. Players took time to develop their fitness and understand the Kennedy game plan. Well as captain I uh, I was on the uh, committee uh, as a player's representative, so I uh, tuned in to, uh, after the fifth loss and, uh, you know, the great murmurings around the committee table. Well, not murmurings, but everybody had to say, and uh, it wasn't to sack John. It was just to, saying to John, well, look, you've just got to change your game plan, John. It's just not working. We've lost five games. And, of course, after about uh, got around to number five saying that, he just stood up and said, uh, gentlemen, there'll be no compromise. And as the season progressed in, in 1960, uh, with the momentum built up and uh, we, uh, we got through the season, I think, and just missed out on the four, just on percentage. 61, we were ready. You know, I think we'd been in the oven for long enough. And I think all the ingredients Mum had put all the ingredients in the oven, a bit like a Christmas cake. It came together really well. We all believed in ourselves. Uh, John Kennedy was a great motivator. 
ready to go. Bring it on. I'm saying, bring it on. We are ready to go. And of course, you know what happened. We lost our first game uh, against uh, South Melbourne at, at Glen Ferry. We weren't really hitting our straps. It was uh, a, a bit of a worry. John was thumping the table and, and looking for the answers, uh, uh, and saying, you know, what do you think? You know, which he still says to me. I can remember saying, look, we must do something and, and um, let everybody see that we're not going to accept four up and four down and that sort of thing. We're going to, we're going to make changes. Well, I always remember Cole. Cole knows this too. He was the unfortunate guy that was out purely because the coach says we've got to make some changes. And uh, we had played badly the previous week and it could have been any one of 18, you could say. But Cole was the unfortunate. I uh, started slowly in that year as the club did. And uh, I can't remember exactly, but I think it might have been we were three wins and three losses after six games. And at that point, we were thinking, here's another year where we're going to finish in the middle. We'd only just missed by percentage in 1960. So we thought we were slipping backwards. And then we won the next game and we then won 12 in a row, which still stands as a record for Hawthorne. And I'm very proud of it. 12 wins for the year, consecutive wins, and we were never going to be beaten. We weren't going to be beaten. Here we were again in 1961, up against our arch rival Melbourne in a second semi-final. The winner going directly into the grand final. That was the game that we had to win. Uh, and there's so much expectation on Hawthorne because of, you know, if they, if they win, it's their first time in a grand final. So you got all that historic, uh, background to it all, so the pressure was on the team to do very it's well against New them. challenger on the block, that's the way I was looking, there was a new challenger and it was the dogs and the dogs beat us out at Footscray earlier in the season. Grand final week at Glenferry Oval saw record crowds and media galore attending training. Selection centred around replacing rover Kevin Connell who injured his knee in the second semi-final against Melbourne. There was speculation that Kanga would go with his great mate Roy Simmons or would he go with a straight rover swap in the inexperienced Jack Cunningham? Everybody wanted Simo in the side. I think that was the uh, the move that uh, uh, could we get Simo as a rover, you know, and uh, uh, to take over from Kevin Connell. Roy had been injured, but he said he was right. Reg had come in when Roy was injured and Reg played so well I think he knew that he wasn't going to be able to see the game through. And as the selectors and John said, your sentiment doesn't win football games. Simo played 200 games for the club and, uh, you know, it was it'd been such a stalwart. You know, in 1956 he ran, I think, fourth in the Brownlow medal, I reckon. And, you know, just a real good player. And, uh, and to miss out was pretty disappointing for him. There wasn't much difference between the grand final side and the side that had played during that year for Hawthorne. But the only change we had to make was that uh, Kevin Connell was injured in the yes. second semi-final yes. and the, the standout player to replace him sort of picked himself in Jack Cunningham. The whole fortnight was quite uh, a strange experience because there was a lot of speculation as to who was going to get Kevin's spot. Um, various people were put up in the media and talked about as what would happen. Uh, and I wasn't very confident of getting there. Yeah, I felt very sorry for Kevin Connell because um, not only being a great bloke, but uh, he's a great footballer. And, you know, he just, football can be very cruel. Thursday night, the teams used to come over the radio. And uh, as I said, I come from a big family and we're all sitting around the radio. <laughs> and uh, Coop was in and that's the only name I heard. I was picked as night, uh, 20th man, and uh, to be just part of that side, even though I played a lot of games during the season, to be part of that side in Hawthorne's first grand final was fantastic. I really felt good about that. I didn't mind where I played, as long as I was in that side. 
It was a relatively normal week. If anything, it might have been... I don't think John wanted to risk losing any players that particular week. And so I think that uh, even though we trained and we did quite a lot of work, there was not a lot of serious physical contact. On the Thursday night before the grand final, uh, Ron Cook came up to me and said, uh, you'll be on your own on Saturday. On grand final day, I was the boss. Uh, the crowd came down on the Thursday night to, to watch us train, so uh, uh, there was a lot of atmosphere around. There was like, um, there was a match on, and it was, wow, you know, there was sort of electric atmosphere. And that's the thing that really inspired me more than anything, was, you know, the, the look on, on, you know, the, the real happy look on their face. Everywhere I went, there was always somebody from somewhere Good luck, good luck, hope you go. People I'd never seen before, never met, never knew anything about them and they were living on our hopes and as most supporters had for the years. Uh, I suppose one reason why I admired the Hawthorne community because they'd been through all those years. But John said, just put that out of your mind. It's not enough just to get there. It's, we've got to win. But there was that thinking among the supporters that it was just so fantastic to be in the grand final. Um, and John had to get rid of the thought that that was enough. It wasn't enough. Match day dawned as a hot September day. Players made their own way to the MCG. All were excited. Many were nervous. I didn't sleep well on a Friday night. And when mm. I got up Saturday morning, I thought, I hope the players had a better night than me. Yes, and, uh, a couple of well, players. <coughs> yeah, the uh, atmosphere became almost almost business-like. Nobody was jumping around, yet players are all different. They have their, their different ways, but it was very tight and it was uh, almost business-like. And I think I checked my, uh, my footy kit about five times. I made sure the Hope Sweeney's were polished. I had new laces. I had a new set of uh, stops. I had a spare set of stops. I checked my garters, my socks, my shin guards, uh, uh, jock strap, uh, correction, uh, athletic support. And I got on the train, got off at Richmond, uh, walked towards the ground and I met Ian Mort who had parked his car and walked over the uh, Yarra Bridge and said, G'day Mort, how are you? And he said, nothing. Never said a, didn't say a word. I walked right across to the ground with him and I said, oh Mort, you all right? Everything okay? I can't speak, he said, because I'm so nervous. He was really, really nervous uh, and uh, I was chatting away like as if it was just <laughs> another day. We met Dawn and Pecky there, and he's going through his bags, he's got his jumper, he's got his boots, he's got his cigarettes. No chewy for, uh, no chewy for Pecky, and he went off his bloody brain. And uh, he had to get Dawn, his wife, to run down to Glen Ferry Road and pick up the chewy and come back. And uh, I said, look, I'll drive Pecky, I'll drive the free snow, we'll go in my car, da da da. And it was the worst drive I've ever had in my life, fair him and he was, he snapped. Dear old Pecky snapped when he couldn't get his bloody chewy. The first thing I did was look for Harry Miller because Harry always had a nice soft pair of hands and, and sort of settled you down and, and, you know, he was terrific. A lot of brown and gold around the rooms. There was uh, a lot of people, but those closely associated with the club, mainly, you know, committee and there's training staff and, and supporters committees and, and those sort of people were all in with us. We didn't believe we'd lose it. I remember saying to Mum on the morning of the grand final, I don't know whether I'll come home in one piece or not tonight, but we're going to win. I couldn't see any nerves or any anything like that. It was, uh, you know, pretty much a, uh, you know, a controlled sort of uh, environment. And uh, we, we, we were confident, there's no doubt about that, because, uh, you know, not only had we won a lot of games in a row, but uh, there was a lot of confidence amongst the, the players and their teammates that uh, we would uh, prevail. It happened to be uh, my 100th game and, and uh, John said, well, it's your honour, Brendo, you know, to lead the team onto the ground. And I would have loved to have led the team onto the ground, except that Graham was a very, very good friend. He's a, he was the captain. It was the first time we'd ever played in a grand final. And I felt that it was his honour, 
not mine. He was a captain and a friend. And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to have to pass on it today, John. I said, any other time I would have loved to have. I believe it was John Kennedy that said that when you run out there, just have a look on top of the, uh, uh, the stand in front of you. And all you saw was uh, Hawthorne's flags and people with her Hawthorne's Guernseys and all that on its scarves. And it brought her home the reality of what we were there for. It was just overwhelming. And to me, I felt that I was there not only for me, but for the people, the supporters. Those people yelling in that crowd were looking for something that Hawthorne hadn't had for years and what they'd strive for. Previous coaches, committees and all those sort of things had worked for years and years and years, got no recognition whatsoever. And then here was a chance for us to do something that these people could cherish forever too and what I've been dreaming of. We tossed the coin and selected the, the uh, ball, the, the match ball on the ground. And uh, of course I was opposed in the toss with, with uh, EJ Witten and uh, he always had to be a bit wary of EJ with, the, with his toss because he was tending to uh, uh, call it before or as it hit the ground and, uh, walk, off. and walk off with the same way kicking that way. So, but Frankie Swab was the umpire, Peter's father, and uh, uh, so Frank was uh, on hand of course. So on. it was and a, such a fine day, it wasn't going to be lost in the mud or anything like that. So, so EJ was, it was 50-50. Dad didn't know he was getting the grand final till he actually got to the ground on the day. So he and Jack Irving, was the other umpire, arrived at the MCG, uh, went down to the rooms, and the selector, can't remember the gentleman's name, uh, might have been a guy called Lancaster, said, Frank, you've, uh, you've got the job today. And my mum was at the ground with her brother, and my auntie and my father's parents and Alan Schwab was a young I think 20 year old cadet at the VFL then so he was there on duties. They knew when his name went up on the scoreboard that he was going to umpire the game. We lined up and the, uh, the Governor General uh, was uh, there to shake everybody's hands so uh, it was uh, I, the thing I can remember about that is that we always used to put rosin on our hands uh, and we had to shake his hand so we weren't allowed to. So everybody loaded up their left hand, <laughs> shook hands and then rubbed the two together. And the thing about the MCG of course, whereas most of the, the, uh, the other grounds you look around at the crowd, with the MCG you're looking up and um, that's just the experience. It is a, it is a sensational arena. You cannot sort of describe it to anybody else and they were all pro Hawthorne or appear to be pro Hawthorne which made the, uh, the crowd sort of noise a lot louder. It all hit home for the players as they entered the MCG to a huge roar from their supporters. The players took their positions ready to play the match of their lives. I started off on EJ Witten and before the game Kennedy used to come around and so you're on number three. I said, Witten. He said, you're on number three. And I said, everybody in Australia knew who Witten was. So I went down there and there was some uh, worries in the paper about him not playing this Saturday about a crooked leg, but he was all right. He'd come out and I said, how's your legs, Ted? You know? He shook my hand and I don't know whether you know Witten's got the shake hand crunch. He used to crunch. Oh, yes. I reckon I nearly broke my hand and uh, lined up on him and um, it was just an honour to play on him. He's the best player that I've seen, except for Graham Arthur. Well now, play has just started in the 1961 Grand Final between Hawthorne and Footscray. There was a missed kick on Footscray. Hawthorne now into attack through the agency of Brendan Edwards. He goes over, trundles the ball in front of him, but it looks as though a free kick will be given to Brendan Edwards on the wing position on the member's side of the ground. Had a difficult quarter, the first quarter, because Teddy Whitten uh, was in sparkling form. He took a couple of marks and kicked a couple of goals. And he's taken the mark. Here he comes. The kick is a good one. It's through, I would say, for another goal, yes. We were beaten for speed early. They were quicker than us. Uh, but 
in the back of our mind, we always knew that we were going to win the day. You know, it was going to be the day would uh, slow down because of the uh, pressure of the, of the preliminary final. But I think we had more opportunities, more scoring opportunities. Uh, we didn't kick particularly accurately, but we didn't give up. One stage there, I remember him being grabbed by a couple of opponents and he just muscled them, just shrugged them off and uh, went down and kicked the ball forward. Well, we had most of the play up to half time. Brendan Edwards was getting the ball out of the centre and popping down to the forward line. <coughs> but unfortunately, we got the opportunities, but our forwards were missing easy goals. They were kicking behinds all the time. I thought we had the game in control except for our kicking. Yes, Waiting right. for Peck to take his kick now. He couldn't miss this, could he? Oh, no, he has. It certainly wasn't going to plan at half time when we were behind. We didn't think we'd be behind. That ends the second quarter in the 1961 Grand Final. There are the scores Hawthorne 3 9 27, Footscray 5 5 35. But at half time, we ran off the ground and the Footscray players just walked off. You could tell they'd had enough. I think at the half time, you know, coming up to half time, we, we knew our fitness was at a level that um, should sustain us and uh, we hadn't had that game the previous week so we're probably a little bit ahead in one way. Well I was surprised, personally, you know, I thought we were certainly a better team uh, than Footscray but the results were not there on the board at half time. That's right. And, uh, but yeah. you brought them around all right. They were a bit quick for us in the first half, and, they, and that's a thing that's very difficult, isn't it? It's a terrible position to be in, even, to, even in today's football. If you've got a couple out there and you're getting beaten for pace, you can't do much about it. Nevertheless, two goals. I was disappointed to be two goals down, but it gave me something to say, to, to, to be able to say to players, we've worked for this. You've worked for it for two years, for one year, here's our chance, and it's being frittered away. If we lose it, everything's gone that we stand for. We've just trained for this, but you know, you've done the hard work and uh, they'll, they'll slow down or they'll get a bit tired and we've got to just keep going. But he didn't get worked up. He just spoke quietly and said, the job was there, we could still do it and it was his, I think, his control in speaking at that time. Then the selection committee made changes. They put Pecky into the ruck and Morton Brown, I think, went to full forward. Um, and uh, by putting Pecky in the ruck, it sort of subdued John Schultz, who was a good player, and assisted jumping Jack Winnicky, who was having a good day, but couldn't jump all day the way he was jumping. There's the score as umpire Frank Swab moves in to bounce the ball for the start of the third quarter of the 1961 Grand Final between Footscray and Hawthorne. Oh. Oh. Brendan Edwards, he drives the Hawks well into attack. Down it goes and the mark has been taken there in the centre half forward position by John Winnicky. Winnicky drives, right foot kick, right down into the forward pocket, a chance for Graham Arthur to mark and he does so. Graham, the uh, Hawk skipper, coming in to take his kick right down into the teeth of goal. They set themselves up, they go, and the mark has been pulled down for Hawthorne by uh, Hill. Coming in to take his kick, tries to run around, he kicks, and yes, in the first few seconds of the third quarter, Hawthorne have booted a goal. They needed that one. Hawthorne, 4-9 now, Footscray, 5-5. It was a complete reversal after half time. We just dominated the play. I mean, kick 6-6, six, six, I think we could have easily kicked eight or nine goals. Um, the way that our style of play probably lent itself to that style of kicking. It's, we just totally dominated the second half. Gary Young is uh, about 50 yards out from goal. His kick, it's a beauty. It's a ripper, this kick. Up they go. It's almost marked right in the teeth of goals there. But eventually, it's Law trying to get his foot to it. Can't do so. He's tackled by players right, left and centre. And eventually, it's kicked. Snapped up very quickly. And kicked by Graham Arthur. A captain's effort from the skipper of the Hawks. We were much stronger. They were certainly probably a bit quicker. But, I mean, Kanga had really raised the bar on the fitness side of things. 
So it was only a matter of time before we ran them down. Our second halves, when you look back through, the, through, through that 61 year, our second halves were our best halves. And I thought then, even though we were only down eight points, I think it was, um, you know, we we're, were going to run over the top of them. Quite game possession. It's kicked off the ground now by. They're trying to work that one out. Trying to pick up that player. It was uh, Ian Moore. I think probably the most significant thing was putting Pecky in the ruck, and he was fantastic. He was fantastic. John Shorts was a ruckman. A, Brownlow medalist and he really cut him out and made it easier for me to come over the back and tap and things like that. Peck who started off at full forward is now rucking for the Hawks and rucking mighty well too because Schultz has been almost shut out of the game. In terms of palming the ball out uh, over the back and uh, yes it, uh, it, it, it did help us enormously. Ted Whitten was the one bulldog man and he was determined that there was always going to be a chance. He uh, ran through Brendan Edwards. However, still Hawthorne are into attack. Oh, see that uh, Brendan Edwards go down there. Teddy Whitten ran straight into him. A Graham Arthur was a Brendan Edwards. Anyways, on the ground. <coughs> a very, very solid one from Teddy Whitten. And to his credit, Brendo got up, as uh, John Kennedy would say. And uh, don't lie on the ground. And uh, Brendo got up and none of the players really would have known that he was knocked around as much as he had. Teddy Whitten was told by Jack Collins to get rid of me off the ground <laughs> and he certainly tried. But I don't remember anything of the game after that. One of the trainers gave me the ball and said, you've got a free kick, apparently. That's what he told me. He said, I don't remember this. And I went back and took my free kick. But, um, yeah, you had to get up. Just shook him off, shook his head and got up again and just went on with it. Uh, you know, all the things you remember about the 61 grand final is Brendan Evans. His game that he played was just outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. You wouldn't, like, to get 35 or 36 kicks, you know, averaging nine kicks a quarter. Not that he handballed, by the way. <laughs> You'd have a sore toe from the number of kicks he had. Clearing now, here's a chance for Fisher. Fisher picks up, drives right into the teeth of goal. Fish was a, a very much a vital cog in, in the, the whole team and certainly in the 61 Premiership team. He was quick and he could maintain that right through a game. And he was uh, running just as fast and as hard at the end of the game as he did at the start. The Bulldogs fellows uh, didn't have the fitness we had and, and uh, John Kennedy's urging uh, to uh, make no mistake about getting uh, the best chance we'd had in 36 years to uh, to get a flag for Hawthorne and it was so important and of course John always was for the jumper, he played for the jumper. Turn out of trouble, get his left foot to the ball, put it right onto the half forward flank for Hawthorne, three Hawthorne players there, one of them must get it, it'll be a kick for goal and it could go through again for another goal and it has! Nelda. What a handy player this is, Reg, to have coming on as your 19th man. He's a handy boy and a 19th man, Jeff. He could be in my side any time, this chap. But still, that's just how strong Hawthorne are at the moment. I believed that we were going to win it. I never had any doubt in my mind that we were going to win that game. And I think most of the players probably felt that. So, yes, it, there was a sense of relief insofar as, yes, you can't stop until the final siren, as you know. Tides the ball up. There's the ball. Uh, the wren comes in, there's the final siren, the final siren. And Hawthorne are premiers for the year 1961. The first premiership for Hawthorne. Congratulations to them from all sporting fans. There is the scoreboard. Hawthorne, 13, 16, 94, Footscray, 7, 9, 51. When the siren rang, it was just enormous satisfaction. We've done it. It was the first one. Fantastic feeling. I can remember specifically that I wasn't going to swap this Guernsey for, with anyone. I, uh, I kept mine. Suddenly here we were. We'd achieved what the club and especially John used to remind us about, is that we were trying to achieve and gain the respect of our opponents.
and uh, popularity didn't matter so much. It was more important to be respected than to be popular. Both Teddy Whitten and Graham Arthur, after the game, they were, you know, their sportsmanship was fantastic. You know, the, you know, Ted would have been so disappointed, yet he, you know, he gave so many accolades to, to Graham and the team. It was, you know, lovely. On the, out on the dais, and he was smiling his head off and patting me on the back and saying, "Well done, Morton," and, and uh, giving a great old yarn and uh, about the game. Uh, now, you know, if you're caught doing that, you'd be uh, giving a kick up the bum, wouldn't you? I can remember going in the rooms uh, afterwards. It was extraordinarily hot, and because it was so hot, and there were so many people in the room, we got up onto the um, lockers. So a number of us were sitting up on top of the lockers and the crowd was down below and I remember there were friends of mine down there who weren't Hawthorne Barrackers, they got into the room somehow. Uh, I think it was just everybody felt that it was um, an enormous achievement for the club. The overall sensation there was that a debt had been paid, which was quite remarkable and uh, the supporters just couldn't believe it. Most of them were crying and, and you know, God. We all thought we'd do it, but we'd never believe we'd do it, and now we've done it. Look at us. He was extremely proud of uh, the 61 year, but I think he was also uh, more proud of the fact that he and others delivered something to so many people that had waited so long um, to, to see, and that was a premiership. Everybody was just jumping up and down and singing the, the Hawthorns theme song, and uh, it was just an amazing, atmosphere. He was beside himself with joy at, at what had occurred and I, and, um, and I think that the Herald Sun uh, on the Monday morning with the cup upside down on his head, um, which was not the sort of look that you'd expect from my father, um, this really said it all. He, um, he had a great night. Uh, yeah, it, was, it, was, uh, it was the culmination of, of really a decade's work, that, that premiership. Victory, a premiership at last, our first. 20 footballers had cemented themselves forever in the history of the Hawthorne Football Club. Lifelong mateship, a bond had been formed through hard work and sharing the ultimate prize in footy. The team had a, uh, a vast range of characters and abilities, uh, but also backgrounds and, and, uh, uh, and uh, professions. Um, and that didn't matter a jot, and that was the important thing. Uh, here's a fellow who went on to be a senior judge of a high court, uh, putting his arm around a fellow who was a plumber or a tradie or, or a truck driver or whatever. None of that mattered. We were just 20 blokes who were the same. Simo and his banjo, uh, he made it. Uh, used to get him and John O'Mahony and John Kennedy get up and sing, uh, sing their songs and uh, used to get us around in groups and play the uh, guitar and we'd all sing. Beautiful banjo player, played the piano also by ear and he was the uh, happiest bloke to have been at the football club for a long, long while. He was uh, the spirit of the club, he was uh, the uh, fellow who dealt out all the uh, accolades. He welcomed people when they came into the club, made them feel at home. Everybody had to learn a song, you know, and the, the coach, he had his special song, you know, and, and everybody had to get up there, and, and it wouldn't matter whether you could sing or not, but you had to get up there and have a go. And I guess that sort of brought everybody together, you know, and you know, it, it, was, it really was. It was um, a, a wonderful at, um, atmosphere. We used to go into the rooms and, you know, we're just happy being together and, you know, we'd have our girlfriends or wives or wh whatever. Uh, he'd play the banjo and sing and we'd, we'd just had such great times. It was real family club stuff. And we all got to know one another and we all respected one another. You could rely on players to uh, punch the ball, to uh, uh, pass it off to you uh, without thinking. And I think that bred uh, a terrific uh, respect uh, for each other, uh, but also a sort of solidity, you know, that you could rely on the guy 
next to you, in front of you, etc. I think we, we, we've got a real camaraderie amongst us and uh, it, nothing seemed impossible. No, it's just great to see them, give them a bit of a hug and a handshake. It's really great and those things just stay with you forever. In 2011, we celebrate the 50 year anniversary of that famous day in 1961 and the nine premierships that followed, our five decades of flags. to present the Premiership Cup of 2008 to Sam Mitchell and Alistair Clarkson. Graham Arthur says presenting the Cup to Sam Mitchell after the 2008 Grand Final was one of the greatest moments he has experienced in football. Thank you Mort and to your 1961 teammates for starting a journey of success for the Hawthorne Football Club. That will continue into the future.